Hey everybody, in this video we're going to talk about some of the common misconceptions about evolutionary biology and uh, evolution and biology in general. Okay, so I'm going to share my list with you. All right, so here is a list of very common misconceptions, uh, misconceptions that I've encountered uh, in my readings, in my teaching. Um, so here we go, one by one. First, everything is an adaptation. There is this assumption that everything is an adaptation, and this implicit assumption comes in questions that I get occasionally from my students about, well, why would major depression have evolved? Well, why would have schizophrenia evolved? Well, the answer is they didn't, all right? They, they are not adaptations. Instead, they may be noise, they may be byproducts, but they, it's very possible that they didn't, all right? Um, <clears throat> you know, a lot of times people get the idea that evolving is moving to a more perfected form, and so we shouldn't have failings, we shouldn't have weaknesses, we shouldn't have problems, but that, again, isn't evolution, all right? Not everything we do is an adaptation, and so, but even some of the things that we wish weren't adaptations may very well be adaptations. And we'll come to that point a little bit uh, later on. But first, I want to get back. I want to simply uh, finish the first point by saying not everything we do, not everything we think, not everything going on inside of us, not everything we produce is an adaptation. All right. Uh, we evolution, and I'll come back to this again a little bit later, evolution is slow. It does not work quickly. Our culture, however, our technology, however, they change remarkably rapidly, all right? Our history books get updated at a rocket's pace compared to how quickly evolution shapes a species, especially at, at, in our body, class, body size class, all right? So not everything is an adaptation, all right? Second, one species gives birth to another species. This is, in a very broad sense, kind of true. That's why I put ish there. All right. It's not, but it's not to the point of, um, you know, so birds evolved from lizards. Uh, it's not to the point of lizards giving birth to birds. All right. So one lizard laid an egg and out popped a bird that flew away. And it, it, evolution never works that fast, all right? You're never giving, never, never is one species giving birth to another species, all right? You get a slow shift over time, all right? Such that if you were then to compare some, a member of that species 3,000 or more generations before, to a 3,000th descendant, they may be different uh, species. But that's, we're talking about hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of generations, all right? So never does a species give birth to another species in one generation, all right? So we and Neanderthals, two different species, had a common ancestor, all right? Meaning we both had the same, I guess you could call them grandpa and grandma, but it's super far back. That grandpa and grandma looked kind of like both of us, but not the same as either one, all right? So when we, uh, so evolution doesn't work to the point of one species giving birth to another. Third, why haven't we seen evolution? Doesn't that show that it's not happening? Well, we actually have seen evolution, all right? We've seen evolution many, many times on a micro scale, all right? Um, in the 30s, penicillin came out, and it was a miracle drug, all right? It was saving so many people, all right? But we now, uh, and after that, we then had sanitation practices. We had antibacterial uh, and my, uh, antibacterial soaps. 
we had all of the strong cleaning solution stuff come out, and now we have the problem of superbugs, all right? Penicillin resistant bacteria, all right? Well, what's happened? Well, when we invented penicillin, we created something that killed off tons of bacteria. And so only those few bacteria that had a random variation, some kind of little genetic mutation that allowed them to survive the penicillin, they were left alive. And because they were left alive, they were allowed to reproduce. And because they reproduced, their offspring had that same resistance to penicillin. And so now we get these bacteria, these superbugs that are resistant to penicillin. They've evolved. The bacteria has evolved. All right. We, we, we see it in bird's beaks. We see it in every uh, species. We've even seen it in humans. All right. If you go back and look at an ancient weapons display or go to a castle over in Europe, you will note that the doors are about that tall. All right. They're super short. Okay. You'll notice that the weapons, all right, if you look, a sword, look at a sword from like um, the, the Persian Empire, the Grecian Empire, all right, the hilts of those swords are about that long. All right. I wouldn't be able to hold a, per, a sword from the Persian army. All right. The from the Persian Empire. All right. Because my hand would be too too big. I'm a giant compared to them. All right. Why? Well, back then, average height of a male was closer to five, four, five, uh, five, five. The average size of a male today is five, nine. All right. And I'm six foot. All right, so if I was walking around in ancient Persia, I would be enormous compared to the average person. All right, <clears throat> and why? Well, food has become more plentiful. All right, so changes in the environment have caused a small and slow change to the species. We're getting bigger, all right? But again, the reason we've seen microevolution it's because evolution is slow. It's almost incomprehensibly slow, all right? Fast periods of evolution, known as periods of punctuated equilibrium, speed up evolution to periods of about 100 generations or a little bit less, all right? 100 generations, think about that, 100 generations. To give you kind of a frame of reference, very few of us have a great grandmother or great grandfather still alive. If you're lucky enough to have that, that's awesome. Congratulations. But very few of us still have that. I don't. Now, admittedly, I'm in my 30s, but um, I don't have a great grandparent alive. I haven't since my, uh, since my uh, early 20s. That's four generations ago, all right? I'm the fourth, all right? My great grandparent would be the first of those four, all right? That's four generations, four let alone 10, all right? My great-grandmother wouldn't have seen 10 generations ago from me, all right? That's, and that's just 10 generations, all right? We're not seeing grand-scale evolution in as little as 10 generations. It takes hundreds of generations, thousands of generations, all right? So if we look thousands of generations ago, we see in humans micro-scale evolution. Humans were very, uh, were much shorter than they are today, all right? And that's thousands of generations. It's, it's uh, estimated that it took Eskimos uh, 10,000 years to evolve the extra, body to, the extra body, the extra fatty deposits in their cheeks, okay? So evolution is almost unfathomably slow, all right? So that's why we haven't seen it. And we're probably not going to see it. We certainly won't see it in humans during our lifetime because it's too slow, all right? So none of these modern changes that we see, social media, technology, none of that, none of that is going to generate observable change in our species, all right, while we're alive, okay? That's a, uh, we maybe, in the year 3020, we might see some changes. But even then, the changes will probably be fairly small. Um, now, 
So there we go. Why haven't we seen evolution? Well, we have. If we look at smaller species that have more generations faster, we can see evolution in them very quickly. All right. So <clears throat> we have seen evolution. All right. Um, now, the next one is intentionality. All right. Uh, sometimes you hear people think, you know, uh, or say something to the effect of, well, you know, that that that's making natural selection like a like a deity, right? Well, no, natural selection. Even though, I, and I mentioned this in a different video, we talk about natural selection shaping behavior, shaping organisms. The words we're using may be confusing, but we're not actually suggesting that a force known as natural selection has an intention and is trying to shape things. That's not at all what's happened. Instead, uh, in the words of Jeff Goldblum, evolution is the process of life uh, 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 finding a way, okay? <clears throat> so it's just organisms being able to reproduce more or less successfully based on the environmental uh, uh, obstacles that they face, okay? There is no intentionality. All right, the fact that we are the way we are is largely a product of random variation. Not entirely, but largely a product of random variation. So there is, an, going, jumping off of that point, for that reason, there is no such thing as more evolved. All right, so, you know, we talk, of, you hear people talk about um, higher on the evolutionary scale or de-evolving. Is it possible that we're de-evolving? No, it's not possible that we're de-evolving because there's no there's no endpoint. All right, it's evolution is not a goal-oriented process. It's not tr trying to do anything. It's not trying to to get to some endpoint. Evolution is just again life uh, 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 finding a way. All right, <clears throat> so there's no such thing as more evolved. Now, the last misconception I'm going to talk about here is um, requires me to step back a little bit from evolution, but it, it absolutely applies. And that is this uh, misconception that if something's biological, then it's good. All right. Um, we get this all the time with uh, things like, oh, well, uh, this is uh, this product only has natural ingredients. Uh, so it's good. Uh, whereas and very oftentimes, I see this quite a bit, somebody will say, here, read the list of ingredients in this brand, and then read the list of ingredients in this brand. And invariably, when they're doing this, that's because they're using, they, they, they're trying to suggest, see, you can pronounce our ingredients, they're not chemicals. Uh, and so they're more natural. Well, if you actually looked at the chemical composition of those natural ingredients, it would look identical to the to the chemical ingredients in all the other products all right well this is a product the reason that advertising style works on people is because of this misassumption that if it's biological it's good all right there's this misconception that all good things are biological all bad things are errors or products of uh, of society or something like that all right but this could not be further from the truth Viruses, natural. Bacteria that make us sick, natural. Um, arsenic, poison that kills us, natural. All right. Um, poison from snakes, natural. None of these things are good. <laughs> all right. These things are very harmful. They're very bad. All right. But they're all natural. Okay. So this idea that something if it's biological, then it's good, is utter and complete freaking nonsense. All right. Can you tell it's a bit of a pet peeve of mine? <laughs> uh, anyway, it is a very uh, influential misconception because very often what happens is that when people, especially in evolutionary psychology, when we're trying to study the um, biological uh, contributions uh, to a behavior, this can sometimes mean that we will suggest things that people don't like, like violence and aggression and hate are natural products of evolution. 
Well, a lot of people don't want to believe that because if it is a natural product of human, human evolution, then for them, they believe, well, then we can't fix it. No, 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 no. Humans and most other animals have the ability to inhibit instinctual behaviors. In certain situations, those instinctual behaviors will come back with a, with a force, but most animals, I can teach my dog not to, not to crap on my carpet, all right? You can train a bear not to maul a person, all right? You can train, organisms can learn to behave in ways that are antithetical to their natural, uh, that are, that uh, kind of turn off or moderate or modify their biological behaviors. And one of the easy ways to do that is humans, not just humans, every animal, our evolved behavioral mechanisms are triggered by environments. So if we modify the environment, then we modify whether or not a particular psychological mechanisms that we don't, psychological mechanism that we don't like gets turned on or not. It's the same way genetics works, all right? Just because we inherit a gene doesn't mean that gene gets expressed. Certain contexts in the environment switch genes on or switch them off. Psychological mechanisms work in much the same way. We have a psychological mechanism designed to react to certain environments. If we prevent the exposure to that environment, that psychological mechanism never gets turned on, all right? Now, so just because something's biological doesn't mean it's good, all right? Now, this naturalistic fallacy, if it's biological, it's good, can cause a lot of problems, all right? Because it leads to things, as I was mentioning, that it biases people against anything that says behavior that we don't like might be biological. And it even leads them to look for explanations or reasons to call things that they do like biological. So it biases our study of evolution, all right? This natural, naturalistic fallacy can warp what we as evolutionary psychologists study. So it's important as you read through this book, uh, the, the Baumeister book, as you listen to my lectures, it's important for you to understand that this misconception about evolution is very much a misconception and you should do your best to kick it out of your head as best you can. All right? All right, guys, that is it for this video. As always, if you have any questions, be sure to send them my way. If not, have a great one, and I'll see you next time.